Hi, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Bridget Burns with the University Innovation Alliance. We help universities share ideas about how to help low-income students. And today I have a really special guest. Uh, I don't know if you have a, a favorite email you've ever received, but for me, it's an email I received a few weeks ago from the ECMC Foundation, where about the week of COVID really kind of happening in the United States in terms of folks heading home, immediately I received an email from Sarah from ECMC saying, what do you need? What do your students need? We're here for you. Which if you work in the nonprofit space or if you work in education, there's nothing that you could wish for more than funders and supporters who are there to anticipate and proactively support you. And so immediately they initiated emergency grants to help our students and they've just been a long time incredible partner for our work. So um, I am so pleased today to share with you the reason why we get incredible best emails ever, uh, the president of ECMC Foundation, Peter Taylor. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thrilled to be here. Thank you, Bridget. So for folks who are at home, and by the way, one thing folks should know also about Peter is he's not just the head of this foundation that is really advancing change and helping support students around the country. He's also on the board for the California State University system. So he is in real time hearing what's happening and having to proactively anticipate and help. I think you're the head of the Education Policy Committee. So you're really, really involved in a lot of what's going on right now. Yeah, stressing over a lot of things. There's a lot to stress about right now, so um, plenty to go around. So, uh, for folks who are not familiar, can you share just a little bit about ECMC if they're having, if they, so they can kind of understand where they sit in the broader ecosystem? Sure. ECMC Foundation uh, is part of the group of organizations that uh, constitutes ECMC Group, based out of Minnesota. We're based in Los Angeles, and we were formed as a foundation, grant making foundation, about six years ago. Um, and uh, we give away about $40 million a year in grants with two primary strategies in post-secondary education, career readiness, helping that young person who's on the four-year track from a low-income first-generation background get across the finish line of graduation, and then what we call career readiness, which is a heavy emphasis on career technical education, helping the young person who's not on the four-year track get the skills, training, education necessary to get a job that pays a family-sustaining wage. Uh, we, we developed this strategy in 2014, made our first grant in early 2015, and since then we've put about $170 million to work in these various different strategies. Well, and one of my, like I said, my favorite email that I received and one of the ways that you showed up for us in a very significant way, and we just saw an announcement last week, that you're doing, um, you're investing in emergency grants to support students during COVID right now with organizations around the country. Um, for UIA, that was $250,000 that was incredibly well needed. Um, I received a message as soon as the funds were deployed uh, from Purdue University that said, we had just run out of our emergency funds. This would, could not have come at a better time because we have a line of students who have needs. And so we're hearing um, all of this need. And I just, first off, just thank you so much for being anticipatory and proactive. That was incredible. Um, but I wanted to see what other, A, you know, emergency grants as a strategy, I think is, is really smart right now because of the flexibility. Um, but I wanted to see if both from your role in the foundation and also with the CSU board, um, what you're hearing students need right now and why that helped to drive you towards emergency grants. Uh, in, in many ways, we're hearing the students need uh, what I would call a return to basics. Um, and it's really important in philanthropy. You know, we like to think about big picture transformational change, but we realize that you need basic building blocks in order to sustain the kind of improvements in student outcomes that we all hope to see and achieve. Um, basics being things like food on the table, like access to Wi-Fi when you have to learn remotely. Those are the kinds of things that you gotta have before you can really focus on helping a young person get across that finish line of graduation. And so uh, we've made many multi-year grants and tried to think about big picture strategies, but in the near term, as this pandemic emergency really hammered higher education, we said, nope, we need to step back and maybe engage in a little bit more what we call charity. In the short term, just helping the young person get through the next month, two or three so they can continue to focus on their studies. So we ended up putting in about two and a half million dollars into this strategy in about three weeks. And we're looking to potentially do more depending on, on where and how this uh, pandemic evolves. You know, the last thing we wanna be, Bridget, is a foundation that puts our head in the sound. 
um, you know, I, 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 I came from the research university sector, you know, where I was CFO for the University of California for several years before retiring. And uh, I also served on the board of a number of California foundations. And I have a strong bias towards action. Uh, the easiest thing to do in this situation is sit back and study, wait for more information, get more data, uh, and a year from now, see what you can do. That would be irresponsible and abdicating responsibility. So we decided to get in the game, try to make a difference. And who knows, a year or two from now, somebody may look back and say, no, you should have done it this way or that way. But uh, in many ways, we're hoping our leadership to have a bias towards action would bring others in the space uh, to do the same. I think that's brilliant because right now what we're, I mean, I think the biggest risk right now is letting the perfect get in the way of the good enough at the moment because students <laughs> need good enough. They need hotspots. Yeah. They need laptops. They need things that are unusual yeah. that universities didn't used to pay for. They also uh, they need flexibility, travel funds, all of these things that we don't really have a spot mm -hmm. where there is consistent funding. And I also have to say, like with the CARES Act having restrictions, the fact that you are providing some more flexible aid is extremely critical right now because there are students who do not fit into the categories um, that the CARES Act uh, allows institutions to support. So that has been immensely helpful. Well, thank you. We, uh, we very quickly looked for good partners, UIA being one of them, but uh, a number of the HBCU schools uh, in the Southeast we partnered with, uh, Believe in Students and Equity, another organization, uh, Mission Asset Fund, uh, solid organizations we knew would put the money to work very quickly, responsibly, and help students stay focused on their studies. So um, we feel good about where the program's gone and uh, would encourage folks, by the way, as a national funder, check out our website, ecmcfoundation.org. We, we don't have specific times at which we accept grant proposals or not. We're open year round. And so we have a letter of inquiry process that's always available. And if people have creative ideas to help drive student success, we hope they'll come to our, uh, our website, go into our grantee portal and, and send us your best thinking. That's great, yes, super appreciate that. And um, so the one th other thing I would point out um, about why this kind of grant making is so, uh, so brilliant right now is that after years of working with financial aid officials and working on need-based aid, it's uh, the one lesson that I took away is that you always trust financial aid directors. You always trust the folks who are in financial aid because they have information about the student challenges that they mm -hmm. cannot share and that you can possibly, yeah, right. the, the nuance of each student's story is so unique and what you want is financial aid folks who have the maximum amount of flexibility because I trust, I mean, they only hear sad stories every day. They have yeah. incredible judgment and they know way more. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so oftentimes when I am hearing from folks who want to create a grant program, they want to create a very specific series of requirements and flexibility, I think, is king right now. So um, yeah. super helpful. Um, and yeah, ECMC, if you, for other folks who have other ideas or if you have unique challenges, um, they've been an incredible partner for us. But one of the other spaces that you have shown up um, is even beyond that about starting important conversations. So ECMC was one of the um, supporters for the film Unlikely, which for, for those of you who are at home, you can watch right now. <laughs> it is available on Amazon, on iTunes, and um, is an, uh, a really fantastic film that we think could be leveraged right now to prompt a conversation about how you serve students who are unlikely in the midst of COVID. And um, I didn't know if you had any other particular perspective on the film or what, I, I'm not sure how, even how you connected with it, but I'm so glad that you did. You know, in philanthropy, it was a friend of a friend who yeah. said, hey, you might want to see this thing. It's really interesting. And they're looking for a way to kind of get this distributed. And, you know, ironically, over a year ago, when we gave the grant to help uh, the distribution of the film, um, because it's, it's focused on kind of those unlikely students, a lot of adult learners, people who have to work full time, go to school part time, um, who, who in many ways are kind of that new traditional student, right? Not the 18 year old who's full time residential, but these are students who are outside of that traditional model. And we wanted to kind of draw attention to that cohort of young person uh, in the hopes that there would be additional thinking about how to divine educational strategies to help them be successful. Ironically, in the era of COVID, that mission becomes more and more important because I'm convinced there will be fewer and fewer full-time students, more and more part-time students, and with 26 million people unemployed, a whole lot of adults who need to go back to school and get reskilled. And frankly, the, the challenges of that adult learner, of that non-traditional learner, 
that are highlighted so effectively in the film, really, I hope are, are, is good lessons learned there for educators as they think on how to, how to serve a group of people who are only gonna increase in terms of the number and demand they bring to those institutions. Yeah, and I think for those of you who are watching at home, um, we're suggesting that folks you know, watch the film and encourage your colleagues to, and then actually have a specific session where you're gonna talk through the different profiles of students who are, who are identified in the film and see where is your institution tuning in to listen to those students and their challenges? Because right now we're in a space where we're all physically far away from each other. And the most important thing we can be doing is listening and making sure that our institutions are set up to hear what is going on and be able to figure out what the new challenge and the new problem that needs solving is, because if we just keep staying in our lanes and doing the same work we always used to do, we will not be able to provide what's needed in this moment. So I think figuring out, you know, how are, what are the listening channels we have for adult learners, for student parents, for folks who are uh, just first generation students, for low income students, obviously, and students of color, but there are rural students, there are just, I mean, the ones who are working multiple jobs, um, mm -hmm. how are we tuning in and making sure that we're listening and that we're paying attention and we're setting ourselves up to find solutions in real time. Yeah, it, it's going to take creative thinking about a, a different business model uh, and a different way of operating um, and, and maybe more hybrid courses, more blended courses. Um, you know, but one thing about higher education, there are a lot of smart people in this space and pool that creativity. I know they'll be able to divine solutions to to serve those kind of non-traditional students. I agree. So, um, well, thank you again for taking the time to talk with us. I know that you have a bunch of really important things that you're doing at all times. So taking a minute out to share with uh, us. And again, um, it's the, that's the first time that I ever received an email from a, a grant maker that was anticipating needs far before they were identified. And especially because in that first week when people, we didn't really even know what was happening uh, in terms of where how it was showing up in the lives of students. So that flexibility and um, I think it also just demonstrates tremendous leadership in the philanthropic sector. And I know that it's encouraging others to step up. Um, for instance, we were able to leverage your investment and Course Hero brought $100,000 to the table to match, um, which, is, which is exactly what we're looking for is it's, it's, yeah. it's non-traditional players who are also committed to seeing students um, succeed in this moment. So um, mm -hmm. very, very grateful for ECMC. And for folks who are interested in learning more, you can go to ecmcfoundation.org. And there was a press release that I will retweet and post below identifying the organizations who are already leading on emergency grants. And there's also a lot of literature out in the field. I know that Hope Lab, uh, led by Sir, Hope, um, by uh, the center from uh, Sir Goldrick Robb, they have been putting out information and specifically encouraging institutions to make sure that you have your emergency grant um, application published on your website. That's something we're seeing is not actually common. So, um, well, thank you so much, Peter. And we hope that we can bring you back on for additional conversations as we figure out what the next challenge is and hopefully partner together <laughs> to solve it. <laughs> thank you, Bridget. Appreciate the time. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right.